Hello, and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show, featuring Jason Zook. In uncertain times, we must change our focus and priorities. This show will highlight social justice issues with the goal of expanding minds and increasing unity, love, and mutual respect for ourselves and our planet. We support the Black Lives Matter movement. Our show aspires to promote social spirituality, which simply means that by coming together, we can solve any of our problems, including the goal of bringing an end to all forms of hate, discrimination, bias, or oppression. We must protect our environment, reform our criminal justice system, and protect every citizen from police brutality. When we come together, it becomes possible to bridge the gaps that plague our society and divide us from within. We the people means everyone. Hello and welcome to the Social Psychic Radio Show. This is Jason Zook. It's a great pleasure I have the opportunity of presenting special guest Deborah Ann Davis to the show today. Coach, author, speaker, and educator. Deborah Ann Davis is an award-winning author, and she's a teacher turned life coach. Her title includes two nonfiction books, How to Get Your Happy On and How to Keep Your Daughter from Slamming the Door, and two humorous suspense novels, Fairly Certain and Fairly Safe. Plus, she's featured in three anthologies, Manifested Blessings, The Power of Your Inner Brilliance, and Her Global Voice. Deborah is a certified personal trainer and an environmentalist. As a life and parenting coach, Deborah's job is to help you recognize what you're doing right and to add supplemental strategies so you can achieve your goals. It's a great pleasure. I welcome Deborah Ann Davis to the show. Thank you welcome for having me. Thank you for coming today. And I appreciate you joining us. And, and I want to ask you, because you have a unique background, in my opinion. I would like to ask you, how did you go from being an educator to pursuing your current path as a coach and an author and as a speaker? Well, it was really circuitous. <laughs> it wasn't like, oh, this is my goal. I, w- I started writing when I got sick with Lyme disease. So I had to basically stop teaching for a little while because it really threw me for a loop. And then by the time I got better and went back to teaching, I had been rid- bitten by the writing bug. So I made sure that I wrote during the summers because anybody who's a teacher knows that when you're teaching, you can't really do anything else besides teaching. There's just no time for anything else. So I would write during the summer vacations. And then um, I ended up with two manuscripts. I thought, ooh, I'm going to leave teaching and become an author. (laughs) (laughs) I left teaching and didn't write anything for that entire next year because that world became how to market yourself and get your name out there and all that business, which does not interest me at all. (laughs) And then about five minutes after I was out the door from the school, I missed it because I've been in school since I was, what, four? (laughs) So now instead of being around hundreds and hundreds of people, it was me and my husband and my computer, which, you know, all three of those are fun things, but, you know, it's not the same energy as a hundred people. So I um, started doing things that would be able to connect me with people again. And what I knew best was connecting parents with their kids. I spent so much time over the teaching years on the confer- at the conference table with an upset parent over here and a sullen kid over there. And there was, there was always some problem that they brought them to the table. And I couldn't really get them to solve the problem unless I could get them to talk to each other. So over the years, you just kind of naturally developed this arsenal of tools, which I, I don't know, I just thought since I could do it, everybody could do it. But turns out it's actually a skill set. So I started putting that into writing. I just, I just thought of something as we're talking too. It's such a logical correlation that you'd go from what you did in the past as an educator, because I thought about this. My mom, I told you, was an educator 27 years, and it flows in my family, my brother, his, his wife, and Teachers are the most creative people we know, right? Educators are fascinating people. So how would that differ from life coaching, really, when you think about it? Because you're life coaching every day with the students in the classroom. Now you're life coaching parents 
and you're life coaching others on skills of life. So that it's, it, I guess it makes a, a very logical correlation there. Yes. And, you know, I know teachers do a lot with bulletin boards and they have a lot of lesson plans and stuff. So how would, I mean, looking at what you did there and then what you're doing now, it, it makes a lot of sense. And I get what you're saying about the promotion yourself, like promoting yourself is that could be one of those things. It's like, I, I'm not a big fan of promoting myself either. And it's funny because like I decided to do the psychic thing four years ago. And for me, it's, it's kind of a similar dynamic. You start out with something you're passionate about, but you realize there's other aspects of it that you have to do in order to accomplish going from point A to point B, right? You got to get your name out there. You got to meet a lot, a lot of interesting people, some good, some bad, some maybe eh. And then you, you kind of find your way, trial and error. And, you know, one of the things I liked about the theme as I was looking up your information, I love, I was looking up your author bio on Amazon and I found your, your story was your, your writing flow. I love first off, I love the way you just come out and share details about your daughter being born and how you reverse engineered her in college to figure out you did the job, right? That sounds like the way my mom would talk. It's so matter of fact. And I wanted to ask you about that because I think that's a Northeast thing that you have that matter of fact, Frank. I don't know. I, I, I do know that there are attitudes from different parts of the country. I, I don't know specifically what the Northeast is famous for, but I do know that there are certain things that I think we're more flexible about change. And I believe that has to do with the season switching around. So we have to switch up our lives all the time. And I think that like with the school year that we just had, I think it was easier in the Northeast because we do switch out every three months. Yes. For, you know, seasons and clothing and sports and <sighs> energy. And and I think that in places, I don't know this for sure, but I think in places where you've got one season, like Florida, uh, we just went to <laughs> Florida or we just recently went to Nevada. And, you know, it seems to me that change would be more upsetting in that environment where you don't where everything is kind of steady. You know what? You raise a very valid point. One's ability to roll with the punches, right? One's ability to go with the flow of change. Like yesterday, I'll just share this with you. I had my AC catch on fire when I was <laughs> when I was recording an episode, right? So I had to conclude my, I look at it, I was in the last minute of my interview. So I concluded the interview, jumped up, ran around my house looking for what's smoking through my vents. I had no clue. Had to call my, the fire department shows up. You want to talk about a scene from a movie? I'm sitting there like trying to figure out, should I, and I have two parrots. I I'm not a parent but I, I'm a bird daddy. That's the closest thing to parenting I have right now. Right. But I'll tell you having that, having all that going on in a short amount of time and then being told a tropical storm might come through Tampa. I feel like I, I smiled last night cause I went in the car to get food. And it also is the anniversary day when my grandfather passed and he's the reason I'm intuitive. So all these, and it's my nephew's 10 year old birthday. So yesterday was a big day. Right. And I'm sitting there in the car and I'm driving to get food. And I thought to myself, wow, I'm alive. Thank God. I mean, my entire AC system's incinerated on the inside. I have no AC right now in Florida in the middle of the summer with a tropical storm approaching with a window unit. And I'm like, you know what? I'm going to go with the flow of punches of life and I'm going to go with the flow of change. And I'm just going to let it like wash off my back. And as soon as I said that yesterday, I felt my grandfather's energy. I looked to the left. He says, look to your left. I'm a medium too. So I looked to my left and guess what I saw? This amazing rainbow Ooh. out of the sky, down to the water. I had to get out of the car to go take some pictures of this moment because I'm like, you know, even if there's chaos and all the things that happen in our lives in the last 18 months or whatever has been going on with this pandemic and everything else, it's like our ability to be able to be flexible. And that's my point in sharing all that with you. Be resilient. The resiliency and the flexibility of perspective though, right? Because mm -hmm. you can have a lot of things happen to you on all these different levels, but if you realize you're going to be all right and everything's going to be okay and you don't have to, like, I mean, you know, within practicality, you got to take precautions, like with the pandemic, you got to wear masks, social distance, wash your hands, et cetera, et cetera. But it's like, it's, it's like having that flexibility of life, having the ability to look at everything and not put your hands in the air like Pollyanna when things get difficult or challenging, right? And so I want to ask you this, and this ties into our interview. I want to ask you, as a new parent that I read about you in your description, can you share with our audience about the birth of your daughter and how you first felt as a new mother and how that changed your life and transformed your perspective to where you are now? I will. I just want to insert one thing before I do that, though. I have been rescued several times in my life. And so I just want to shout out to the firemen who showed up to you, your house and say so thank beautiful. you so much for what you do, because <laughs> I, I have to share something and add to what you just said. 
I've never had a fireman come to my house in my life and I'm 45. So, you know, I've lived in different places. I've never had a fire emergency. I've never had the fear of there's something in the walls burning. I have no idea what's going on right now. And it was, it was, it was unsettling. I had a, I have a fire extinguisher and I was running around outside of my building. Cause I live in a multi-level building. I was running around outside with a fire extinguisher in my hands, trying to figure out what to do while calling the fire department. Cause I had no idea. It was new territory. And I do want to tell you, they were amazing. I apologize. I was like, Oh my God, my little AC unit. I'm sorry. You guys came out. He was, that's what we're here for. We're here to prevent fires. So you, everything worked. He said, your fire detector, your smoke detector work. You called night, you called the front gate. They called 911. We showed up. We took care of it. So that made, you know what? That made me feel, I want to donate money back to the fire department and I want to do stuff to, to show our appreciation. Cause you're right. They're amazing heroes. I mean, yeah. not all heroes wear capes. A you lot know, of heroes wear helmets. The ones to run into the building when everyone else is running out. <laughs> exactly. And I saw that firsthand yesterday and I was so grateful and appreciative. I'll, I'll and just share one quick story. I was in, I've been in three fires in my life. All of wow. them were during college. All right. So none of them were mine. They were always around, yeah. but they were kids. Okay. But I was living in a dormitory that is 22 stories high in at UMass in Amherst. And I was on the tail end of a little minor tragedy in my life, which was a collision with a drunk driver oh. that had made me lose a semester. But I was back on campus with um, recovering from broken legs and <laughs> and um, no, it was all good. I, I, yeah. I know it sounds silly, but Not it, silly. It was a life changing <laughs> experience. And, and I, I basically went through the whole thing with no pain. So. Go figure. I went from shock and to, to straight to meds and never had any pain. So it was all good. So, but the point is I was on the 17th floor when there was a fire on the 18th floor and we didn't know where the fire was, but we had, were filled with smoke on our floor. And so there was no elevator and I was on crutches. So I ended up hopping down 17 flights of stairs with the, a couple of firemen and a couple of boys from my floor making a semicircle around me. So it was all the people running by us, try, you know, kept them from bumping into me, kept me, stayed with me all the way down to the angels. To the floor. My leg was so tired. <laughs> Those but are your that, angels, right? I mean, that's, that's, I felt that way yesterday. I felt like what happened could have been perceived as a much greater tragedy. And I consider it uh, like guardian angels helping you in the form of human forms. And I just, I'm so grateful today. And, and yeah, I woke up in such a way that I'm like, yeah, we're having a tropical storm come to Tampa. I can, I can enjoy the wind. I'm not worried about it. Like yep. uh, it's just having that smile. And I feel like you have, you must have a very strong spiritual point of view. I would like to think because of the different things that you've gone through with Lyme disease, a, a car accident, injuries, fires, Everything yeah. is a learning experience. Yes. I mean, it's in hindsight, it's an adventure. And, you know, I, I don't regret anything that I've, I've gone through because they, I must, uh, you too, we're all some totals of all of our experiences. And I like the person I am now. Absolutely. So all that stuff contributed to it. And it makes for great stories when I was teaching. <laughs> <laughs> it makes for a great story while you're on a show. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> right now. I, I was a little bit more graphic with stories when I was talking to my students because I wanted them to, you know, walk away with a little, a little shred of fear of them when we're getting ready to do a lab and I needed to share with them about the dangers of being stupid in the lab. You know, they, they needed them to be safe. So how do you think our school system is going to handle going into the fall with the pandemic raging? Like, what is your opinion? On I that? don't know. And I don't care. Because every school is going to be doing differently. Whatever it is, each individual school decides. There will be people polarized on both sides about what to do. All I care about are the kids. Mm -hmm. So if I may just say something for the kids, for the parents, this is the message you need to be giving to your kids. I got your back. You don't have to worry. It's going to be fine. And so right now we are, the plan for school is blah, blah, blah. I don't know if it's distance learning or going in with masks, without masks or alternating, whatever it is their plan is. There is a plan in place right this minute. And some schools have started back already. Anyway, maybe we're gonna stay that way the whole school year. 
And if so, I will help you adjust however you need to adjust so that you will be strong this year. And if there's something going on that I don't know how to handle, I will find someone who does. So you don't need to worry. And if they switch it up because they decide that this isn't the safest way to go, or they decide we can go further because it's very safe, then I will help you make that adjustment. So you don't have to worry about it. I got your back. And you if sure. they switch it in a way that I don't understand, I will find somebody who has the answer. So you don't have to worry. All you got to do is learn the things that a kid your age is supposed to be learning and enjoy this year. Plus, remember this point. Every single year, we start in a new school. There's new kids. There's new teachers. Everything is different. So you're used to change. It's not that big a deal. And every year, at the end of the year, there's another change. School starts, stops, and summer starts. It's not a big deal. We all just switch what we're doing. So whatever changes come this year, you're going to be fine. And just remember, you're used to change. You're not the same person you were last May. We change every second. Exactly. Our bodies change every second, right? Our new exactly. cells are free. You know what? That's actually, I think, one of our greatest barriers for most people in society is adjusting and, and being flexible with change. And, and being able to look at change as, as something that's a constant throughout life and not something to fear. Yes, and they forget that they change all the time. They really do change all the time anyway. <laughs> so don't be afraid of it. You've, you've done change before. You're going to do it again in the future. It'll be all right. I've got through more change in 12 hours than I did in 12 weeks, but I'll tell you something. It was a very powerful roller coaster, and then I'm on the, I'm on the endorphins of it, and I'm enjoying the future. Like That's how I look at my immediate future and long-term future is the more you can embrace the change and actually like enjoy the process of it rather than, you know – having a pity party for yourself. <laughs> Although I will say there, there, there are points, there are good points to having an occasional pity party. It's just like every party that you go to in your life has an end. <laughs> so go to your pity party and then go back home. Let me ask you about environmentalism. Cause that's important to me too. And I want and my show actually has a focus. On, I'm trying to, I'm trying to get more awareness of that as an issue. And I wanted to ask you, what is your viewpoints on improving our environment on an individual basis. Oh, and there's so many things you can do. <laughs> so many <I'm> <laughs> easy things you can do. Um, I used to teach environmental science, AP environmental science. Do you mind if I share one really please, funny story? Please, please. This is why I ask. I want okay. you to share. Please do. Um, I was teaching in Hartford in a school where the principal wanted to have more AP classes than any other high school. And so she achieved that by making the kids take AP classes and signing them up for it based on their test results. Like, oh, this kid academically can handle it. So the kids would come to us in September with a schedule they hadn't seen before with AP environmental science on it. Now, AP is advanced placement. It's for college credit, and it's a whole different level of education for high school kids in terms of time commitment. So to be handed this without planning for it was very upsetting for the kids. So I'd end up with the first day of class with all my classes, the kids going, I, I didn't sign up for this. And then they weren't allowed to switch out. Okay, so that was my class, right? It was <laughs> inner city and I had four classes of it. And I had this one girl who came into my class every day and she'd slam her books down on the table and she'd say, I hate this class. And she was all like, fingernails and hair. Okay. And so I just did my thing. You know, I, I, I um, tried not to take it personally because I understood that this was her frustration about not being able to control what she wanted to do. Plus she didn't want a class she didn't like to ruin her cum because she wanted to go places with college. All right. So that was our situation. <laughs> One day she walks in, she slams her books on the, on the table I mean, she literally did it every day. But this day, she said, Miss, do you know what my boss did? I was like, whoa, that, that's different. But I schooled my features, and I'm like, uh, <laughs> what did your boss do? She, works, she worked in, like, in a pharmacy, right? She goes, he throws away all the old newspapers and magazines in the garbage. 
and inside of me, I'm doing like a happy dance. I'm going, Ooh, she, she's hurting me. I'm affecting her. Right. But on the outside, I'm like, oh, well, maybe next time you could just t- say something to him about recycling them. She goes, I did. He said that if I was, they were going to get recycled, that I'd have to do it. So inside, I'm like doing cartwheels and flipping. And on the outside, I'm going, oh, well, maybe next time you could take a couple out to the recycling. I mean, who knows? She goes, I did take them out to recycling. I broke my fingernail. I hate this class. <laughs> it's like when you get that, at least she's a, it's a breakthrough moment. Yeah, a breakthrough moment. You start seeing some fissures in the little cracks in that facade, yep. right? Of that self-centeredness of that age and you, you're reaching them. Yes. That's got to be a breakthrough moment for you as an educator. And as a human being, you must find enjoyment. I would. <laughs> well, I loved it. I love the humor I behind that story that will actually answer your other question about what thing, what you could do. I had lessons that I was teaching them about how to conserve water, you know, how to shorten your shower, because everyone thinks that you need to cut your shower in half. But if you just shorten it by a minute, we were calculating how much water would be saved over the course of the year, which was huge. And then I said, so look at what I'm doing personally. I have 20 kids in this classroom. And if you all shorten your shower for one minute, this is how much water we will save. And then if you get one person in your family to shorten their shower one minute, that number doubles. So that following Monday, this girl walked into my class. I don't know what it is about the girls, but they, she walked in my class and she said, I was brushing my teeth and the water was running and I shut it off. And I said, that's what Mrs. Davis would want us to do. And I turned it back on. <laughs> what did you say to that? I, I said, no, well, no, I didn't have to say anything. The class just started laughing. <laughs> so I'm just like, Okay. But the point is, when you when you tell people things they can do that are easy, that are easy to fix in their lives, that don't inconvenience them, they're more likely to do it. So turning off the water when in between rinsing your razor when you're shaving or putting a little water in the sink and sh- swishing it around in there instead of running the water. And don't run the water when you're brushing your teeth. The water is a going to be a very tight commodity. I don't know if you've seen what's going on in the water oh, levels, like at the Hoover Dam and stuff. It's very scary. It is scary. And every little bit we save now slows down this process of the, our water being a, pri- a problem. Those are little things, you know, just don't turn the shower on full power. Just crank it back just a tiny bit. You don't have to make it dribble, but all every little bit helps. And so if one person listening to this podcast makes any of these changes, it contributes. And again, if you can get somebody else in your household to do it too, that doubles the impact. So I call it the ripple effect. A little bit here and a little bit there creates these ripples. Everybody can do a little bit on their own. Do you think the damage of, say, Trump, for example, with his anti-environmental positions and not acknowledging global warming and looking at the environment as a serious thing. Do you think that's done long-term damage to our society in light of what we've been through the last several years? And I'm not trying to be political about it, but I'm just saying he was president for four years and, and did not do hardly anything for global warming to be prevented. I would like to say that I, I'm not going to go down a political conversation, yeah, I don't want to do fine. that. but I would say that our country and its leadership has been remiss in this whole conversation for the last 20 years. Mm -hmm. So does one president cause more problems than another? I'm sorry, none of them stepped up to the plate and fixed it. None of them said we need to do this back then. So if I'm gonna be finger pointing, I'm not gonna pick one person and go for it because no matter how, (laughs) how uncomfortable I was over the last four years, the reality is it wasn't fixed the eight years before that or the four years before that or the 10 years before that, or, right? I mean, the, I, the stuff that's going on in Europe is so much more advanced than what we're doing here in terms of protecting our planet. And I don't know why we are not jumping up as a group and saying, 
why aren't we taking care of things? Why are we still doing factory farms and doing things that are doing monocrops and, and spraying pesticides and losing our water, water systems? And I mean, I was, I was in the seventh grade when Rachel Carson was doing her thing about the silent spring. Right. And Silent Spring, for those of you who don't know, is um, a book she wrote about the fact that you don't hear bird noises anymore because of all the pesticides and things that were killing them. And yeah. they, they start cleaning up things like the Connecticut River used to be so polluted that if you fell in it, you needed to go to the hospital. So, I mean, they were they were literally dumping raw sewage into it. The, there were pipes out of buildings that they flush the toilet and it go plop, plop, plop right into the river. I mean, that was all acceptable. You know what I think of when I grew up in New Jersey, syringes washing up on the beach. Yeah. <laughs> when you're on the beach and you want to go in the ocean and you're having medical syringes, medical waste washed up. That's got to be a warning sign. Come on, let's get yeah. the environment straight. Uh, how about when you drive into New Jersey, sometimes the smell is so that bad, so we had to bury our faces. Right? On the turnpike, I mean, on the turnpike. It's like where exactly. everyone passes through Jersey, right? Why Why didn't that not make sense to people that we needed to be fixing things on a global level for the country? And you're right. So, and that and that's like 50 years ago, too, because the last yeah. 35 years I've been living, we've been talking about this stuff since 1970 blank. Yes, yes, right? yes, yes. With Nixon. Yes. And so, now so, we're so many years later and not much has been moved. So do, do I want to point fingers at Trump? Yes. Do I want to point fingers at Obama? Yes. Do I want to point fingers at the other people? Yes. 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 Makes yes. Makes sense. Makes sense. Non-politician person, because I just I don't have faith in them having our best interests at heart. You know, interesting, as as, as we're talking right now, global warming, it's ravaging the planet. Climate change. Climate change, I should say, is ravaging the planet in such a way that you know, recent reports are showing that it may not be reversible, <laughs> that it might be too late. I always think of myself as an optimist. I'm a glass half full kind of person. Do you think it's too late or do you think we still have the opportunity to reverse things in, in a real what way? I know for sure is that I don't know for sure. I have no idea, but I can't think in terms of that because that will emotionally paralyze me. So what I think of instead of that is what can I do to help the planet? And that's what I do. I help the planet. I don't use the reuse the plastic garbage bags that they have. I don't. Uh, and if I end up with some by accident, because you do, then I use those again and again um, in different trash related scenarios. Instead of buying big garbage bags, I put stuff into little garbage bags so that it won't stink. I have yet to do this, but my plan is this fall is to clear some land around the side of our house where it's like, you know, invasive species all growing in the vines and stuff, and then make a compost pile out there. So I'll further reduce my footprint. And I, I'm very conservative about my usage of water. And sure, everybody around me may be using up my share. I don't care. My contribution is that I, that's what I do. And I, I avoid fast food because that's part of the big cog in the wheel of the um, abuse of the planet. Land for the cows and the corn that they grow to feed the cows, which is not what cows are supposed to be eating. So there's this huge amount of flatulence, which causes methane gas in the air, which is a global and air warming gas or whatever. So what do I do? I don't eat fast food. I make sure I buy everything organic. I, in the seasons here, I buy local every chance I get. And I conserve water. So those are the things that I do. And if somebody listening to this podcast says, oh, I could do that. That wouldn't be hard for me. I could do that too. Then boom, I have doubled my impact on the planet. I do, I do love your example earlier with telling your class that if you reduce your shower by one minute each, can you imagine if our podcast, podcast audience did that? Exactly. Right? And if, yep. if that happens, then this whole conversation, <laughs> it's worth it anyway. But That's we have right. an impact as a result in a positive way from our conversation. Right. We should urge the audience to reduce their shower by one minute each. 
on a daily basis and just do it in that way or reduce the setting on your shower. So it's not blowing out as, as heavy as it could be. And you could smile the whole time you're taking that shower because you know, you're helping mother earth. Exactly. And you're helping your children and your, and you know what, this factors into parenting. When you think about it, you can't be a good parent and not take pride in the environment because you have children that you're raising. So if you have children that you're raising and you love and you care about, and you want to care about the future, then what are you going to do? Get rid of the home for those people, the environment? Like it it doesn't make any sense to me. Yep. You just have to model the good behavior. Exactly. Exactly. I want to ask you this, looking at your background, what do you feel makes an awesome mom and why? Okay. So you mentioned earlier that I reverse engineered my daughter to figure out that I'd actually done a good job. I went, I'm a high school person or a middle school person. So when my daughter was born, I really didn't know what to do with that part where, you know, she didn't know how to talk. And then I was nervous all the elementary school years and stuff because I was worried about messing it up because it was not my area of expertise. Then by the time she got to middle school, I'm like, yeah, I know what to do here. So, you know, hit my stride. But when I look back on it, she turned out so great and she was always great. So why didn't I understand that I was doing a good job at the time? So that's what my message is, is that you are doing a good job. Look at your kid. Exactly. You can walk and talk. How do you think they figured that out? You taught them. I love that. I so love that. here's the thing. With the, with the parenting part, if you will take a moment to look at how far your child has come since last year and to take stock of all the good things that you have done and in, inputted into that child's life to get them where they are, then you can understand the kind of job you're actually doing. But most people don't do that, which is why they need a parent coach, because a parent coach says, look, you're doing this, this, and this right. Let's tweak that. Let's add this in, and you're going to hit the ground running again. But the thing is that parents are isolated. They don't look at other people. And when they do, they think, ooh, they're doing it so much better than me, my poor child, you know, which is ridiculous because if that parent's got it going on and everything is perfect and and I like to say there's no spit up on their shirt and <laughs> the kids all have their hair combed and their socks match and all that. They're getting help. There's somebody helping them, whether it's a spouse, a parent, a, a neighbor, a, a babysitter, a daycare center, whatever. They're getting help because if they've got a job and they're juggling kids and they're juggling a relationship and they're paying the bills and all that, Nobody does that smoothly by themselves. You have to get help. So what makes a parent awesome? An awesome mom is a person who tries and tries and tries. They try to find things for their kids to do and ways for their kids to learn and places for their kids to go and things that will make their kids engaged and things that will help their kids do relationships. They go and look up the information they don't have on their own. And then they make it their own so they can use it for their children's benefit. And at the end of the day, after everything that they've been doing, they collapse on the couch, but the awesome parent gets back up again and starts in again. They go make that dinner. They go help with the homework. They right? All that is what makes a parent awesome. That's it. It's not about being perfect because a perfect person is a crazy person. That's, you know, trying to achieve perfection <laughs> creates anxiety. It, it models an anxiety model for your children. It makes them feel like love is conditional to their being perfect, which it, love is unconditional. They are loved no matter what they do or who they are or how they feel or what their opinions are. They are loved. So the unconditional love means that you cannot have perfectionism. So that's my take on being an awesome parent. I could tell you already awesome. I could just say, I could tell you're an awesome teacher educator because a couple of ways I share this one, the way you were comforting students in the mock situation earlier, when you're like, I'll handle this, you focus on learning. I'll handle this. I'll deal with this. 
if if we had that in our school system more regularly, I feel like children will be more at ease because you're right. The, the intention of being in school is to learn and to guide and to increase life experience for your students. And if you do that, when you do that, you're giving them the best message possible. You're telling them, you know, I know things are a bit, a bit hectic, uh, you know, a bit uncertain right now, but we're going to create certainty. You pass it on to me. I'm your educator. I'm going to take on the uncertainty. You focus on what you're good at. You're going to learn. And it, it, I just find that so empowering. And, and, it, and I feel like it's calming too. Yes. It's definitely That's a message, calming. right? Yes. And it's a thing to say for, for the parents to say, I'm your parent. I got this. You don't have to worry. I, I know it sounds simplistic, but that's a strong message to give somebody. Exactly. And, and I, I give you kudos for sharing it on the show today because I, I think it's a powerful message. And I appreciate that. I want to ask you, you're a prolific writer. What is it that you like the most about being able to create something and write something and get it out there and something you're passionate about in your life that you find from experience that you'd like to share with us? You know how when some people are telling a joke, they're like laughing through the joke because in their mind, they're anticipating your reaction to the ending of it, right? That's me when I'm writing. When I'm writing, I'm like, oh, this is going to be cool. Oh, this is going to be funny. Oh, this is going to be insightful. And I'm all excited, you know, while I'm writing. And I really enjoy that process. And I'm about to start writing again. I'm very excited about the prospect. I have a few things I have to take care of before that. I'm putting together a parenting course right now. So I'm writing the script for it and it's going to be filmed. I mean, it's like a whole big professional thing. And then once that's done, I'm going to go back to writing. And just yesterday, somebody asked me, what are you going to write next? I've got three things in the hopper and I have no idea which direction I'm going in. One of them is fiction. So it's a part of my, it's, a, it's the third book in my, um, I'm pointing over my shoulder, <laughs> my, my Love of Fairs, Love of Fairs series. The second one is this book. You see how thick this book is? How to Keep Your Daughter from Slamming the Door? I cut it in half. This is half of it. The other half is sitting there going, Mom, are you going to come open me up and start me again? So there's that. And then the third one is the real reason that got me started on this process, which was a student who was having trouble with an abusive boyfriend and she wasn't even old enough to drive yet. And so I ended up helping her with that. I'm shortening the story up for, for the sake of the, your broadcast, but the, I ended up helping her with that with a series of little activities for her to do to help her focus on what it was that she really wanted and to help her get people's voices out of her head in terms of this is what you should be doing. This is what you should be doing. So that book, I ran into her like five years after she and I were working together. So she was graduated and stuff. And she had laminated this little cheat sheet that we had made together of her view and uh, about guys and dating and stuff, the, the must haves that she couldn't have, she couldn't, she would not be happy without in her relationship. And she introduced me to a friend of hers who had a little cheat sheet in her wallet that they had laminated. She had done the exercises with her friend and the two of them are going, well, we've been single for a while now which was the point that you can be happy with yourself for a little while until you find, you know, be patient and picky till you find somebody who is what you want. I mean, we're talking about 19 year old girls here. We're not talking about 35 year old women, right? We're talking about little young people who are sitting there going, I'm okay by myself, which is what I wanted to teach them. Anyway, I, they told me I needed to put that into a book I, at the time, I wasn't a writer. I was still a science teacher. And so it didn't occur to me to, that a book was going to be anything I was going to do because it never occurred to me I was going to write. I have that. I've got this much stuff associated and more. with Yeah. And more. I have to say one thing. When I'm here, you give these examples. Not all heroes wear capes. Not all heroes wear capes. And I've had some monumental figures in my life who are educators, who are mentors, who 
really took a personal interest in my life and helped shape me where I am. And I know you did that obviously in countless, countless examples. And you're doing that in a large spectrum now as an author and as a parenting coach and even coming on as a guest for a show. It's like your message, it resonates really well with me because I enjoy the fact that you have a pragmatic approach where you're like, you know what? You're not perfect. And if you think you're perfect, you're crazy. Stop it. <laughs> right. <laughs> I feel like you have this direct stern approach. And then I feel like you have the ability to, to connect with a lot of different, different people on different levels. And that's your gift is communicating in such a way, in such a, in such a method that people become inspired and learn from what you, you share. And well, it's, not just, so. <laughs> it's not just from what you were as an educator, it's from life skills. And mm-hmm. with our uncertainty in, t- in the times we're going through right now, I think your, your lessons are, are even more valuable. It's, it's imperative. I have to ask a question. So how do you keep your daughter from slamming the door in your face? Conversation. Conversation is the key. But if you're already at that stage where the door slamming is going on, <laughs> then the conversation that you need to have with her is at a nice time when things are calm. For me, I always say I would get a bottle of nail polish and go sit with my daughter on the stoop, which she, by the way, said to me, Mom, you can't write this book because I never slammed the door. And I <laughs> said, well, why do you think that is? But you we prevented were- her from doing it. You communicated with her. So get a bottle of nail polish. We'd go sit on the stoop, shoulder to shoulder, not facing each other. So you, there's no misreading of facial expressions. And we lean over on our bellies, on our legs and paint our toenails. And we talk about the important topics like how did exams go last year? Not what the grades were, but how did you feel taking the exams? how did you feel the first exam versus the last exam? What would you do differently this year? How do you feel about that boy when you had a crush on him when he looked at that other girl? How did you, you know? <laughs> and so it just it's non judgmental, and you're bringing up all the conversations that are going to make them tense. And for those of you who don't have girls, rearrange a kid's bedroom and paint the walls together, do a garden together, fix a motor together, reorganize the garage together, and let those conversations just flow naturally. When they have those, unimportant conversations with you when nothing is hanging in the balance. Like they want to know if they can go to the school dance tonight. (laughs) We had that conversation during the summer. So whether or not school dances are going to be allowed, you've you've already talked about it when there was no school dance on the horizon. So you could relax and, and share conversation. So have the conversation when it's calm. If you are already banging heads and you say, you know what? I love you so much and I don't want to bang heads. So I believe there's a better way we can do this. And I'm going to be trying different things to to make it so we're not banging heads. I'm just giving you a heads up. So when I do something different, I don't freak you out. But if I'm going to make changes, I'll tell you ahead of time. So when we're in the middle of something, you'll understand what's going on. So tell them. And then it's okay to be transparent about, I don't know why we're fighting I don't know how to fix this. I'm in the process of learning how to make it better. It's okay to be transparent with your kids. And then the other thing is, if they're not in a place where they'll hear you or engage with you and talk to you, they are still registering the fact that you are also dissatisfied and you wanna make it better. They, that business about not engaging and talking to you is because they don't trust you. And I'm going to tell you, if you peel back the layers about what causes a lot of these problems, it's not what you think. I mean, yes, there are tragic things that happen in people's families, but outside of that, people have different learning styles. And on my website and in my book, I cover a lot of stuff about that, but You can go online right now and find free stuff for about learning styles. But here's an example. I like the simplistic ones. You can find some learning style inventories that have like 18 different learning styles. That's not what I'm made up of. (laughs) I think the one has three. The um, visual, the auditory, and the kinesthetic, which is like touchy, moving. Say you are a auditory learner and your kid is a visual learner, Okay. Your kid's watching TV and you go in and you say, 
I want you to dump the garbage when the show is over. And they say, oh, okay, right. So six hours later, the garbage is not jump, dumped because you've given an, a visual person an auditory command and they don't process it the same way. But what you do is you write a little note and you stick it on the table in front of them and they say, when they're done with the show, they see the note and they go, oh, the garbage, and they'll go take it out. All those times where you're banging heads and you get upset, because for you, this is like yeah. the 9,876 time this has happened. It's like, boom, right? And the child's like, why are they so mad? Where's that coming from? And their trust in you understanding them and having their back starts to get whittled away. So when there's a question like, the girl I really like is, I kiss this boy and I feel horrible about it. They're not going to come talk to you about that stuff because they don't feel like you understand them and you get them. So you say something to them like, take the dog out, right? And they blow up out of nowhere. It has nothing to do with the dog. It has nothing to do with what you said. It's because they saw the girl they like kiss that boy. And you don't have any clue that that's going on. Because you're disconnected. That's right. So... <laughs> Conversation is the key. Have the little conversations at times where they don't matter. And the school year is starting. So you need to talk to them about keeping those, the um, rules the same this year. Don't switch up the rules because everything else in their lives are going to be changed. So don't change bedtimes or, or curfews or any of that until after first report card. Then you know they're handling the year and then you can loosen the reins. But if you loosen the reins now, and first report card shows that it was too much, then when you tighten the reins, that's perceived as punishment, and you don't want to go down that road. The way you just broke that down, if parents could hear that or if teachers could understand that better, I feel like it would be a breath of fresh air for people. I want to say that by having me as a guest on your show, it allows me to give that message out to people because, I mean – I live in I love a it. I, I love this. shout it from the sidewalk. Yeah, no, <laughs> totally but I, 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 hear it, so. I love the fact that we could have this conversation and this discussion on all these different levels, right? From environmentalism to teaching to parenting. I'm not a parent, but you know what? A lot of my members of my audience are, a lot of my best friends are. And I, I, I get, I'm going to say that everything you're describing, it's, it resonates with me I, I'm, as a psychic medium. I'll talk to clients when I do that. Right. Or even on my show, when I talk to people and I'll say, <laughs> I took some notes when you were talking. First off, I'm a, I'm a visual auditory learner. And I knew that when I studied for the bar exams, I'd pace and walk around and just memorize things by talking them out loud. Yes. And I would, I would retain, I'm talking like 27 Florida law subjects. I somehow learned by reciting it and learning. And it's probably why I like doing a podcast so much. I like to hear my voice. <laughs> and I'm saying that obviously facetiously, but I always tell my clients, nourish your inner child. I tell people that, you want to connect with each other and a relationship isn't just in, in love. There's relationships in all aspects of our lives and we have to relate to each other. And that means understanding each other's point of view as well as like approaches. Right. Yeah. Uh, and, 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 and you broke that down in such a succinct way with your answer just now, it, it was like, it reverberated with me. And I know you're not just meant to be an educator because all the other things that you're sharing right now have so many broad applications. And so I, I appreciate that. And, and the insight is you could tell from your wealth of experience as a parent and as an educator, and you also have in, strong intuition, in my opinion. And I want to ask you, based on your background and everything that you've done, if I was to say, how do you view spirituality from the lens of being a parenting coach or as a parent? How would you, how would you approach that? I, I don't, I don't know. I, you, you've asked the question. I don't know how to answer. I don't understand how people define spirituality. I could try to help you with that a little bit. I, I, I started out thinking it meant religion mm -mm. and I'm very, I have very little exposure to religion. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I believe that, that if you are honest with yourself and you forgive yourself and cut yourself some slack and step back and recognize how far you've come and the challenges you've had and what you've done and, and how really magnificent you are. 
and get all that stuff out of your head. The, the media and the commercials who say, this is what you should be driving and this is what you should be living in and this is what you should be wearing. And, and go back to, like I did with those little girls, about what you personally really want. Laminate it. Look at it. Remind yourself of it. And let all that other stuff fall aside. I don't know if that's spirituality or that's not. What? Can I say something? Yeah. You just answered my question as I would expect you to perfectly. You know why? Why? You just defined it in such a way where you're saying, at least this is how I got it. I view spirituality from a personal point of view. What I mean by that is I don't attribute it to any organized religion because I feel everyone's spiritual. And the way I define spirituality in my mind, just so you, I didn't get a chance to give you this. So I know that you answered it. You answered it perfectly on point, by the way. But I consider us all made of spiritual, spiritual energy inside ourselves, right? So we're all these vehicles and these vessels of spirituality and we connect with one another. So my concept of spirituality is exactly what we're talking about this past hour. You may not realize that it falls into the spirituality category, but it really does. It's how we treat each other, how we look at the world around us, how we fit into the world, our role on the planet. It's all those things. And so you just answered that exactly perfectly when you basically said, don't pay attention to the commercials. Don't be pay attention to the material things in life. Because when we die, all these material things stay here and they rot. Mm -hmm. What matters to us, at least to me, is what are we doing while we're here? How are we improving other people's lives? What steps are we taking to connect to the larger whole within ourselves and throughout? And so you you just approached it, and, and I know you didn't think of it that way, but you actually approached it exactly the way I meant you to <laughs> ask you that question because you you grasp spirituality, whether or not you call it that. Your concepts are spiritual, whether or not you realize it. Everything you've talked about on our show today is spiritual. Excellent. You're helping people. You're helping people become better versions of themselves. You're coaching people. You're giving guidance to people. You're reducing uh, anxiety. You're showing that you know what? I'll take care of that for you. Yes. If that's not spiritual, then what the heck is? I, I don't even know what to say. Thank you. <laughs> I'm being honest with you because a lot of these, you know, a lot of the stuff we're talking about, obviously, you know, I have some prescripted questions. I want to talk about this and that. And you know what? The heart of the substance of everything is a appreciating you because of who you are, because I have the insight of having amazing educators in my life. I value education. And I know a lot of people appreciate what you're doing and you may not always get a thank you. You may not always get, you know, the, the, the biggest amount of praise, but you know what your praise is? It's like that little laminated card. Yes. Right. Yes. And, and I'm going to share an anecdote. I have a teacher I'm real close with from high school. I'm still close with him and I'm 45 years old. His name is Mr. DiGiacomo. This guy, amazing. He's an unsung hero like you. And I will just say that people who mentor and people who shape and life coach and do all these things that are so valuable for others, you're never forgotten. You're always remembered and you're always appreciated. And guess what? I bet you the girl that had the laminated card, her daughter's going to have a card like that someday because you gave her that idea and that thought is a thing and that intention is there. That's the ripple effect. That's your ripple effect. Yeah. <laughs> just like if everyone takes one less minute in their shower, which I'm going to do tomorrow and promise you that <laughs> I'm going to ask my audience to do that because I want the focus of the show to, to look at everything from different perspectives, including environmentalism. I, I think it's so important right now that we appreciate our environment. It's our home. It's where we thrive. It's who we are. We're a part of the earth. We're interconnected with the universe. That's all spiritual too. Yes. Right. Exactly. And so you know, I, can I always on. say thank you to the universe because it's moving me in a place that I don't know how I'm getting there, but just I'm, a, I'm enjoying the ride. And you're in a great place to go. I want to ask you this. Five years from now, where do you see yourself? Ideally, I know this is going to sound like, um, oh, just go for it, Deborah. Okay, so ideally, I will have affected over half a million parents in their relationships with their kids. That's what I would like to have five years from now. My personality type is that I like praise. So yes, I would like to have some credit for that. But the reality is if I don't, it, that's not as important as fixing 500 million, uh, 500,000 relationships. If I could fix 500,000 relationships, then I'm, affect, I'm affecting twice that many people in two generations and then the children coming up behind them for a third generation. 
And that kind of a ripple effect that that can affect their children's friends and their friends and the way they do things. I see, I see my daughter saying things to her friends. Uh, she's in her thirties now that we said to her, she's saying those things to her friends. And so when we see her friends that they're like, Oh yeah, Rebecca said, blah, blah, blah. And it's the same life lessons that we've said. Those things go on and on and on. So where would I like to be in five years? I would like to be able to sit back and say, I have affected that many people. I would also like to have learned how to play tennis. <laughs> I'll say something. Since I'm psychic, I could do this if you're okay. But I'll say in five yeah. years, I see you doing parenting retreats. And I do see you having ripple effects with what you're going to be doing. And I think you're going to have organized groups of people that are going to be working with you. You're going to work with organizations. You're going to literally get hired to go into large groups of people and give like a parent retreat weekend or parenting tips 101, or you're going to have these, the stuff from your books, you're going to create into programming and you're going to go and get hired to go give presentations to people and large groups of people. You're going to film it and you're going to have a social media presence with whatever the future of social media is in five years. I see you thriving. Wow. See you and that's just my clairvoyance. As you were talking, I had images of you on a stage. Yeah, so exciting. It, was, it was in the middle of like a woods type of thing. So it looks like it was rustic. It looked like they built the stage and it was around trees and it was beautiful. And there was a fire on the, it was at nighttime though. Wait, you, are, are you sure that's not a past thing? Cause I held a retreat like that in 2017. There's going to be more. We had a fire outside. There's going to be more. I see more in your works. Oh my gosh. See, I never mean. used to do this in my earlier versions of my podcast. I get stuff all the time. I read energy, but I figured, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm going to be in my power right now. I'm going to be real with who I am. And, and, and I'm going to ask watch. you a question. Yes, please. Which book? The, the teenage book, the one that's for the kids, for that, that the girls did those exercises or the second half of the mom book or the third one in this series of my novels, which are YA novels that have like parenting values and family values. I, I get a hybrid approach. I think you're going to take a little from each of your projects and create it into a comprehensive, all touching kind of thing where you can work with children, help them with their creative voice. I think you're going to work with parents. You're going to help. You have mock scenarios where you have like a, a parent and a child in front of the group or maybe actors or something like that, where they come in and act out different scenes to give examples. The stuff we talked about at the show today, uh, the de-escalation of things with between a parent and child, you're going to give scenarios. I literally have circles. I don't know if you have things with circles and flow charts, but I see you with circles and flow charts. <laughs> There you go. See, I don't usually and just read. <laughs> yeah, I could just see you doing that. And that's probably from right there. But I, my clairvoyance is really strong. So I just incorporate it as like my interviewing skill. It's my own unique thing. As we're talking, I can see you being very busy. And I do see you doing the parenting retreat. So that's going to be look, something to look into. And I think you'll do virtual ones too. I wouldn't doubt it. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited because that is really the direction I wanted to head in. That's me being the classroom again. <laughs> goosebumps. See the goosebumps? Oh, yes. yes. I get goosebumps when it validates the fact that what we're discussing is accurate. So I will say to you, I, I would say, mark my words in five years, you're going to be like, hey, Jason, remember back in 2021, <laughs> you were telling me about that air conditioning issue you went through? Well, listen, by the way, I'm doing these retreats now, and I'd like you to see what I'm doing. You'll send me a link or something. I had people do crazy things like that years later where they'll come to me after the fact. I remember when I first, I'll give you one side though, and then we'll, we'll wrap this. But I had, I had someone come to me my first year, I started reading professionally and I used to record all my readings and we'd meet in person. And she took the transcript and she took my recording and transcribed it. And she said, she came back two years later, like right before the pandemic, she came back and had to have an appointment with me. And I'm like, all right, no problem. We sit across from each other. She has like a binder, nice and professionally all done. She typed out my prior reading and she has a checklist of 18 things that I told her in order. And she goes, I literally am on number 16. So I need to know what's up coming up next. <laughs> I'm like, I don't work that way. But hey, thanks for that compliment that what I'm picking up has happened in your life. I mean, there's some really random things like you're going to end your other relationship at some point when you get sick of this person, you're going to meet a new person, you're going to change jobs, all these things. And, and she said, check, check, check. <laughs> and so it makes me laugh sometimes because I love the podcasting side of me and the lawyer side of me, but the psychic side is also something I love. So it's like kind of like the way you do your things. I have one more question to ask you. Yes. You may, not, you may not know the answer to this, but I've gone to psychics over the 
years here and there, you know, more for fun than for anything else. But every time I try to tape record it, it doesn't work. It, when you listen to it, it goes every single time. I wonder if you're giving off energy interface. Well, well, yeah, I can, I, I, as you just said that, I can tell you, I think I, I get answers when people ask me questions. I think you have high energy and I think you give off intuitive energy because that's why it's easy to read you. I can read your energy like crystal clear when I'm looking at things. And I feel like you might give off, like my best friend, she has high energy and her phone goes dead a lot. Electronic devices will be affected yes. and impacted. Things will crack in my, things go crack. I have this uh, beer fridge kind of thing I got in my living room right here. I had to unplug it during the podcast because- if I'm talking to people and I start reading people, you hear crack, crack, crack. It starts making cracking sounds. And I, I thought it's a flaw in the in the motor, but it's only when I'm reading people or when I'm doing something intuitively. And, and keep in mind, we're working with energy. Even though we don't see it, it doesn't mean it doesn't exist. And I tell people who are grieving all the time, even though you don't see your deceased loved one, they're with you. They're like the Wi-Fi signal always on. Mm -hmm. And so I share that with you because I think that's probably why you got that feedback during recording sessions. Okay. Now, for our show right now, there's no feedback, thank God. And I think Zoom figured out how to <laughs> harmonize our energy. I haven't had it on Zoom. I've, I've just had it when I'm tape recording, like old cassette tapes. Yeah. When I tape recorded a, a, a reading, someone was reading me. It's a, that's the only time it's ever happened. It's never happened well, on Zoom, but um, I'll say I'll say this to you as well. You said the peel the back the onion earlier. There's synchronicities that happen every day in my life, and I was just talking to someone about peeling back the onion. A couple of different people when I gave readings this week. You got to peel back the onion, huh. and so I feel like the universe lines you and I up to meet today. There's a synchronicity involved in our conversation to share this episode for our audience, and I believe that the passion that you share and your message and all these things are lining up for you for a reason. Everything you've gone through from this point in time, from the time you were born to now, is preparing you from where you're headed the next five years, in my opinion. I agree. I agree. And you're but and you're I, spiritual. What you've, just, what you've just done for me is made me feel renewed hope and in real, in imbued me with energy and all this excitement right. because I had been floundering around for like the last two years trying to say, do I really want to keep going down this path? And my blessed husband said to me, why do you think it should all have come to fruition at this point? You've been putting things in place all along. So, yes. you know, so he- and you're a hero. In my book, you're a hero. OK, any lives that you touch in a positive way, you're a hero. And I believe very fiercely in that. And, and, and for me, this is purpose for me. When I know that I can give guidance and clarity, that's what I do. Right. At least when I'm not doing shows, I give guidance and clarity to people in my life, even not when I'm reading people. I have my, my family calls me up or I'll have so and so say blank and ask me questions. And I find my purpose doing that, just like you have your power of working with parents and working with children and writing books and doing all these prolific things that are amazing. This is one of the things I enjoy to do. Interview people, give readings to people and give clarity and reassurance where people, I'm not doing anything really in my book. It's like, if I look and I see I have a black shirt on, which I do, or I see your amazing books behind you or that awesome seashell on your shelf, that's what I see in my eyes. But as an intuitive, reading energy is the same thing for me. So it's nothing that, you know, mystical or that just people don't understand it and people don't know how to, like you said, if you don't have the conceptual lot for it, a paradigm for it, right? People think of psychics and they think of Miss Cleo from the 90s, or they'll think of Whoopi Goldberg from The Ghost. And a lot of that has that validity to it, but not the Miss Cleo. That's probably a bad example. You, I'll say what it is for me, when you think about art, like that you have people who do impressionistic painting and people who do portraits and people who do landscapes, it's all art, but they all do it differently. And that's how I've always perceived the psychic world yeah. and the people who do it, they, they all do it, but they all do it differently. And you know what? I'm going to tell you something. You're going to be like, okay, you and I are very similar in a lot of ways. Our spirits are similar. You know, I'll say this why. When I am creative, when I, I'm working on another podcast, I'm co-producing with somebody. And I, you're the first person I ever shared that with. And I guess now I just shared it with my audience. But my point is, it's something that I birthed. Like I created the opening for it. And it's a voiceover with music and concept and a script. And I did it and I birthed it. I was so proud of it. And you know how you came up with your book and I'm sure you wanted to share it with the people important in your life and you're so happy about it. That was me last night. I got the, I got the recording back of this intro and I'm just like sending it to the different people in my life, right? 
And I'm sure they don't realize how important it is that I'm sharing that with them, right? They're yeah, like, oh, Jason's yeah. doing another thing. He wants to share this with me. But yeah. for me, it's like, it's like a curtain's opening mm-hmm. on the inside of my soul right now with my, with my creativity. And I love it. I love creating. I didn't know I loved creating so much until I started doing the podcasting stuff for I many didn't years. Know I love creating because I was teaching and I spent all my creative energy trying to find ways to make the kids go, ooh, or hey, you know. <laughs> so I, I, that's where all my creative energy went. And since I was, I have like a science mind, but I have the creative side of the science Beautiful. mind. And I just always thought I was not a creative person because in my mind, I stereotyped creativity to be drawing. Like I, my, my stick figures look like they're suffering. I, I can't <laughs> draw. But, but I just thought that it was a matter of me not being a creative person. I was okay with that. But it turns out that I am a creative person. You are. Yeah. Who knew? I, I consider myself and I never knew it until just, I've only started calling myself a creator in the last four months. And I've had my podcast for several years, but I didn't really acknowledge the, the significance of what it does for me. Like, it's not about what it does for other people. It's what it does. And you're probably the same way. It's what it does for me. Yeah. Because it's been therapeutic in the last 18 months that I can create episodes and get my mind in different ideas and concepts and things I'm passionate about. I can showcase having you come on the show today. It's I want to showcase an educator who's creative and has a parenting, a parenting skill set that fits with transformative coaching and is spiritual. And guess what? Pod match. Here you are. <laughs> Blessings, <laughs> right? Blessings. And when you reached out to me, I was like, really a social psychic. I don't <laughs> see how that's going to match at all. <laughs> and you know what? It, it matches the way you're serving your audience. Well, and honestly, my audience couldn't be served unless I had someone like you coming on to talk about your specific skill sets mm-hmm. and how it ties into everything else. And that's what I think is so important. I, I practice law normally during business hours. It happens to be a Friday and I happen to have lulls in my schedule right now. Can I tell you how much I enjoy doing this? <laughs> Wholeheartedly. I'm in, a, I'm in a condo right now where my AC is not even on. I feel like it's 25 degrees, right? Is air conditioning cool? Because of the passion of it. Mm-hmm. The passion of it. And I thank you for coming on today. I know your time is as valuable as anybody. And let me ask you this. We, we got so involved in the conversation, I didn't even ask you. If our audience wants to connect with you. How would they reach out to you? And oh, that. Yeah, that. All this conversation about trying to reach people. We didn't even <laughs> care. Um, well, my website is DebraAnnDavis.com, and we're in the middle of revising it. So it actually looks actually quite odd today. So something happened when we switched the theme. Anyway, <laughs> it's okay. it, it is a normal place. Also <laughs> on Facebook, I have a parents group called The Mom Meetup. And I have another one called Life Advice 101. And people are welcome to reach out to me there. And if you want to work with me, you are more than welcome to reach out and email me. Info at DeborahAnnDavis.com. And I, what I have is on my website, my funky looking website right now. There's a questionnaire you can fill out because my first session with people is free. And I don't want to spend that whole session learning about you and your situation. So you fill out this questionnaire, whatever you want to fill out. I read that. So when you and I come together, we can sort things out because my job is to, like we said before, figure out what you're doing right and then supplement it, build on it, use your foundation. I am definitely looking forward to keeping in touch with you because when you have these other books come out, I would love to showcase you on our show again. And anything parenting oriented in my life, when I have clients come to me and they're talking about difficulty with their children, I now have someone I could say, go contact Deborah Ann Davis, check her out. She's got this amazing skill set, knowledge base and approach, and you need to check her out. Like, oh, oh, and the other thing I totally forgot. Anybody listening to this podcast, if you send me an email, I'll send you a free copy of my my um, digital book, How to Get Your Happy On. Okay. It's science great. based. <laughs> great, great, great. I appreciate you and um, and thank you. I just want to thank Deborah Ann Davis for coming on the show today and sharing such a unique insight and having such an amazing conversation with one another on various topics from environmentalism to parenting 101 
to being spiritual and and making an impact in the lives of others and and doing so in a way where I feel Deborah is, is one of these people and and there's so many unsung heroes out there people who who shape minds and and inspire and guide and help I mean these are the words I get from from someone like Deborah she's has the ability and, and, and as I said earlier, it draws back my own memories of, of amazing educators that I've had the blessings to benefit from and mentors. And, you know, not all, I'll say this again, I sound redundant, but I strongly believe this. Not all heroes wear capes. And she's a hero in my book. She's somebody who's taking her knowledge as an educator, her selfless work and becoming much more and doing a lot more. And remember a couple of things, takeaways. One, next time you go take a shower, Think of us one minute less. If you could do one minute less on each of your showers, reduce what we produce in terms of our carbon footprint, we can start making an impact as a society. I should say we can do a lot working together and yeah, sure. You could have the child that slams the books down on the table. You could be like that and be like, I'm not going to subscribe to this. It's not going to make an impact or a difference, but then think to yourself, if you want to have children, or you have children, or you know someone who has children, think of them. You can make a difference right now. It doesn't take our elected officials and our world and our governments to get together and truly impact the environment and the planet. It takes each of us individually. And that's a huge thing that I think each of us need to really recognize and appreciate. And so I know Deborah's an environmentalist and she's a parent and she's a coach and she's an author and there's all those different labels. But when you boil it down to it and you peel back the onion, She's an amazing person with a heart and a desire to help. So check her out, check out her website, check out everything. I'm going to have her information in the show notes. So you'll be able to see that. Thank you for tuning into this episode today and stay positive. When you're positive, anything's possible. Thank you. Thank you for listening to this episode of the Social Psychic Radio Show. Don't forget to join us for another episode next time. If you enjoyed the show, we'd love for you to subscribe, rate, and give us a review on iTunes. You can also check us out on Facebook, and don't forget to visit the Social Psychic YouTube channel. Until next time, it's a big world out there. Keep an open mind, embrace your paradigms, and know that the universe is always yours to explore.